this is an exhibition at Garrison Art Center called Punto in Aria, which in Italian, and we have uh, we have Tiziana here, so she can she can uh, she can chime in anytime. Uh, but Punto in Aria, like literally translates as point in air. Uh, it also has it's a kind of lace. Punto in Aria is a style of lace, and also has come to mean line in air and stitch in air. And um, so people will often say it literally means stitch in air. And um, I, I thought that was a beautiful, I thought, I'm thinking a lot about echoes, right, throughout this whole thing, and that will come up again and again. And uh, I thought the echoes throughout all kinds of art practices of the of this term, punto and aria, as well as being this beautiful mm -hmm. kind of place, um, you know, the idea of line in air, the idea of drawing, the, the notion of lace as a kind of a drawing, as a kind of mark making with a needle and thread, um, and so all of those echoes out to, to drawing and to kind of the geometry and the, and the line work of lace was really um, important to me. So the piece that you see, so in this show, everything, I wanna talk about the lace first because this has become, as many of you know, a, a, an, an entirely um, kind of an, an entire project on its own. So the, the piece on the wall, which, was is the only thing in the whole entire show which had existed in some form before June of this year. Everything else in the show was created since June. I don't recommend that, by the way, but um, you know, it, sometimes life with the pandemic and all the other things just happens. Um, I, nothing else in the show was even like a, a, an inkling in my eye or whatever. Um, but this piece was actually two different was two different pieces that were about I don't know between twelve to fifteen feet wide. And then I added, so like this one sort of went, I'll show you more pictures, but up to about here. And then I added additional length to it. So it's now at around 39 feet. Um, all of these pieces of lace are dyed individually three or four times, like dyed and dried, dyed and dried three or four times with cochineal insect dye before they are sewed together. Um, I had been thinking a lot about lace and labor and all of that, and um, the labor of lace made visible through this acc accumulation of these things, right? Something that is in a way a very hidden labor um, and usually very small and intimate, becoming something very large so that the labor becomes you know, visible in ways that uh, in a sense can't be ignored. Um, so, the, so when I started this last year, um, the, I, we were in lockdown and I, I, I had been working with family lace. I'd been working with lace before, but it was family lace or things that I had, had bought or whatever. And someone sent me lace, Meg Pierce, an artist in Florida who I didn't know, sent me a box of said, I have some lace, do you want it? So she sent me this big box and I took a picture of the box, but regrettably that's all I took a picture of because I didn't know that the boxes would keep coming, right? So by like the third box, I was like, this is a thing, this is a thing. And I need to pay attention to it. And so one of the things we've been talking about in Crit Lab a lot, this term this fall is like paying attention to what shows up and welcoming everything that shows up as content and then making decisions about how one might move forward through that. Um, and so, so the, this became an archive. And so I have been documenting and it's the lacearchive.net, which thank to, thanks to Randy Shandrosky was up in time for the show, um, but is in no way complete or even organized. There's you know, the information here about, about the some of the contributors, some who are in this room right now, um, and the grant that I got it around this project and all of that, but it is, this is my winter project, is to get this updated. I've now, uh, I have now documented, so here's some of the people, some of the are in this room, Karen, uh, Heidi, Christine. Um, this is a short list. There's more, um, there's more people on this list. And, um, and so right now it's this, just as kind of a, doom scroll of stuff. It will be organized and, and kind of done like that. But for the show, we wanted to have it have it up. One of the things that also happened is that people started sending me notes. And you can see here, this is a, a little pa pack of lace that someone gave me that with a little nose, note that said that uh, her family's from Russia and they hid their lace in caves during World War II. So I started to get these amazing notes. And this lace, by the way, is chemical lace. It's not like an extraordinarily valuable in like um, objectively valuable. Um, but the thing that's so interesting is that people have this lace and 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 don't know always what to do with it, right? That, that it's often made by members of the family. The family doesn't want it. They don't want to store it. They, and yet they don't want to throw it away. They don't want to give it away. They want, and so the, the kind of letters that I've been getting 
um, and there's a letter that I did, it's not in this, in this is a six page handwritten letter about this very large, what I think probably was going to be some kind of bedspread or something that someone's grandmother had made with cut lace that was unfinished and still in process and all that. So in this one, she writes the whole story about her grandmother and was known as Chick Wooster. And, you know, there's a little quote on the back about what um, a quote by her grandmother used to say something about the, the lace. Um, so this has been incredible, you know, incredibly powerful for me from like a very simple note, like, you know, so happy they have a good home to people really um, sending me very long detailed notes about the people who, who wrote it. So we had the, this on view on an iPad in the exhibition and also on QR codes, just, you know, for you thinking, conceptualizing, right? Some larger ideas when you're thinking about that. Now this table I have here, you can't see it over here, you'll see a picture later, but we had a little donation thing. So beginning of the show, someone had brought a, a, like a nice, you know, fat bag of lace, had left it very early on. And, um, and um, by the end of the show, and I, I'm kicking myself, I didn't take a picture. This is about a week or two before the end of the show. By the end of the show, it is completely jammed. <laughs> like I have bags and boxes and everything of this just amazing treasure trove of lace, each one with a, a note um, talking at least about who the person is and where they are from. And then there was room to kind of tell the story. And I, I haven't even had time to go through these, but you know, look at this. I mean, it's incredible. Um, you know, people contact me and, and talk about the lace and ask me questions and, and also about their stories. And, you know, is it okay that it has stains? Do you, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and so that's been just this amazing thing. So the Lace Archive is a whole project. And alongside that, we had some wonderful events at the gallery. This is um, Elena Carnegie Lou, who is an amazing person. You have to follow her on Instagram. Her, I think it's Arena Naomi is her Instagram. She is, uh, works in the textile, uh, text, I can't remember the exact, which like studio at the Met, you know, it's one of the textile labs. Um, she's a she's a lace expert. She's also just this incredible person. Um, <laughs> she came to the gallery with wearing bright red Vivian Westwood shoes with like the animal toes, you know, and dressed in all the flowers in her hair and stuff. She grew up, I don't think she'd mind if I said, she grew up as a Mennonite and now she's this, you know, amazing. And she was Courtney Love's costumer for seven years. She's the co-founder of the Brooklyn Lace Guild. And so when I first joined the kind of lace rabbit hole community, which is like everything that you ever find, well, there will be a rabbit hole. <laughs> it's been amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, are they going to think like I'm, you know, the lace destroyer? And she was like, oh no, it's great. You know, you're preserving and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, she came up and I had the lace study box, which is this box, like incredible crate, which I still have. Um, in from the International Organization of Lace that you can use to study lace. And she came and she talked to, she, she, people brought lace. She talked about the histories. It was just enormous fun. She was incredibly generous and she's incredibly knowledgeable and also just, you know, just, just a kind of an awesome human. Um, so she went through her own rabbit hole and went study, went to Europe and studied to make lace and she does bobbin lace and stuff and talked about like identifying lace and histories and stuff like that. So it was really fun. So this part of this is really important um, to me. And I also did a couple of natural dye workshops. Uh, there's some, I'm de demonstrating cochineal reacting to the pH of the paper and turning black. Um, and <laughs> so we did a lot of dyeing of lace and materials and um, that's some cochineal bath. And then also sewing the lace together, which was really so much fun. So I am, because of the grant um, I got from Arts Westchester, I will be doing a couple of workshops in my, for those of you who are local to, to the New York area, I will be doing a couple of workshops in my studio because Garrison is not in Westchester. So they keep reminding me, they're like, Patricia, Garrison is not in Westchester. <laughs> you need to do this in Westchester. Um, and so this was just, you know, so we, it's fun, basically, and, and really gratifying. People brought lace, and, and I, I don't have pictures of like some of the crazy things that people brought, family stuff, but anyway, so those are like, that's kind of surrounding conversation of, around this, um, this work that is, to me, inextricable, right? It's not, it's inside the work in, in many ways, not outside the work. So this is the, I'm going to walk us backwards through the show. This is the main room. You actually enter through another room, but um, so this is the piece that was, again, 
um, two smaller pieces like about like from there and then from here over. And so this middle part is all new and everything else is new. The, the large piece here and then the large piece in the window, in the other room in the window, not as large as this, but that I'll show you are all completely made from lace that people sent me. So there's lace of like from all, I mean, there's some very old lace, there's new stuff, there's crochet, which, you know, some people say is needle or is knitting, not lace. There's um, animal fibers, vegetable fibers, uh, synthetic fibers, although not very many synthetic fibers, and, um, and all kinds of lace, machine lace, chemical lace, handmade lace, bobbin lace, cut lace, <laughs> everything you could imagine. Um, and again, I, you know, was thinking last year in particular really about the kind of, um, the, the, the ideas around labor, domestic labor, the labor of women, the hidden labor of women, um, as well as, you know, thinking of the aesthetics of the lace, the kind of geometry, the mathematical aspects, and someone can encounter this show and, and, and think of it, you know, on an aesthetic level. And Ernesto, I think said, he said uh, an ethical aesthetics is, is what he is interested in. So I'm so excited to have him here, but, um, you know, thinking that one can approach this on multiple levels. And if one stays with it, one can explore and discover different aspects and different levels of, um, of the, the kind of narratives inherent in the material. So you, most of you who know me know that I'm a material culture girl, right? Like I'm very interested in the, the content bearing nature of materials and, and bringing those materials to bear in a way that is both visible, right, where that this sort of con material content is visible and also has a complexity. So, um, so obviously this is work, the, the material is very visible. It's lace, it's linens, it's these domestic materials and, and all of that. And that's really important to me. Um, and playing on that, that space between transformation of materials and kind of, um, you know, the, the sort of materials being really explicit and visible in their, in their content. So, um, so the 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 these pieces, the wall pieces and the and the um, the skirt, which is called "Where There Is Serene Length," which is a quote from Gertrude Stein's book "Tender Buttons," which I, if you haven't gotten, you absolutely must. It's like one of the greatest things ever, um, and I love that book and read it over and over again. But um, so the these are mo are very much a large proportion of them are lace that people are, or materials because it's not only lace that people have sent me, and then also stuff that I have acquired over time. Um, so, um, you know, I was thinking really, really carefully about this. One of the things about this opportunity to fill a whole, you know, a whole place is to think about it as a, an object in and of itself, an artwork in itself, and not, uh, I, I wasn't interested in, in doing a show where I had groupings of, you know, objects I had made, kind of different, you know, not retrospective exactly, but in that sense of like retrospective installation of, of objects that I had made. I really wanted this to be a singular artwork. So the whole show is really one artwork comprised of these different uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, branches, if you will, um, that echo one another. So that as one moves through the show, one is, is kind of having these, these sort of um, subconscious or maybe not so subconscious echoes throughout uh, of different materialities, different material weights, different visual weights, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just the back view. Um, and on the, another view, I, you know, I could have pruned this last night, but I didn't really do it. So you're gonna get a bunch of views, but I can move through them quickly. I also, this is also made specifically for this space, right? really designed for the space. So, and one of the things that I also love is that I think I love this about fabric too. Like I can think about the environmental footprint of the objects, right? I, I'm I'm thinking about that a lot. Like what what is the what is the what is the you know the ethics of that? The environmental footprint of you know us us who make things, right, in the world, um, and also my desire to make you know things that have a monumentality, but not wanting to have like ginormous macho objects that require like enormous resources and storage and and et cetera, et cetera. So the fabric in addition to all the other sort of more more kind of fundamental well i don't know if it's more fundamental all, all the, the other reasons why the fabric is so um important to me is is that i and the th the sense that these things are always kind of in the process of becoming they're ever they're not actually ever fully made <laughs> um that's really and going back to our conversation last night for those of you who are here about like the the kind of embarrassment of an object or the embarrassing object you know the idea that something is is an incomplete thing and, and is in the process of, of, of 
of being made. Um, so there is in this space, I think, oops, um, there is in this, well, you'll see it a little further. There are these three columns and you know, you have to work with the columns. There's no getting around it. And so I wanted to address the columns, like be present with the columns and, and in a really explicit way. And so I designed this to be, is nine feet between the columns. So there's one foot on either side and a foot on the top. So it's about an eight foot tall by seven foot wide um, skirt shape, if you will, um, built like a hoop skirt and um, to, made to fit in that space. And what's exciting to me is that could be like much taller. It could be, you know, it could hang, you could go under it. There are all sorts of possibilities that are implied by the kind of nature and shape of this object. Um, and the same thing for the, um, the pieces here. And I'll talk about that in a second. I just wanted to say something about the, the ex votos, which are on this, this piece is called Lamentation for a Reasoned History. And um, I had done a bunch of these lamentation pieces and had thought of them very much as kind of mourning objects, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, and um, have included these ex votos, which are, uh, ex voto means, oh my God, what does it literally mean? It means like a, a, a blanking. It's kind of like a, a wish. Not, that's not exactly right. But basically, those are, there have been ex votos of some kind in cultures all over the world throughout history going, you know, way back to ancient times. The, the ex votos that we are sort of most familiar with now are come through the started in Italy and have spread through the Christian world. And you'll see them a lot in, um, especially in Southern Italy, but also in, in Central and South America. Um, and I am particularly interested in the body shaped ones. So like you have a leg, it's like, I hurt my leg, please, you know, please heal my leg or thank you for healing my leg or, you know, um, that kind of thing. And, and some kind of like a wish request um, a, a, in gratitude or in memoriam, right? Or, and in devotion. Those are the kind of the functions of those objects. And so I've been working with those and making, making these kind of like, you know, somewhat intentionally crude um, body forms that um, are, are kinds of things that you would see. Generally they're in metal when you see them in, in life. So that's, um, that's those. And, um, and also, you know, the other thing of course is this, you know, the geometry of the lace these kind of cut shapes become both positive and negative. And then with the white here, this becomes a negative on a positive. So this kind of um, figure ground thing is kind of flipping back and forth between the wall and the, the shapes and the space between and the things on top, which is also very interesting to me. Um, so this is the other piece that's in the, in the room, the entryway that you can see. And, you know, these, again, this idea that these are objects that are sort of incomplete, like, you know, much of it is sewed, but there are also a lot of it that is just pinned. Um, so that uh, this notion of contingency and action and all of that is important. And, um, and also that the idea that these, these pieces could continuously, um, you know, expand, they could be enormous. And one of the things that happened when I was making these, of course, I was like, I didn't necessarily want to do the whole last show had in New York last year. Everything in the show was dyed with cochineal. And I was really, um, you know, I, I was, I don't know, the idea felt really ready for, for to, I wanted to push it. I wanted to try something different. I wanted to also wanted to make the most vulnerable things I could possibly make. I wanted to try and make the most vulnerable things I could possibly make. Um, and that's that embarrassing thing that we're talking about, like bordering on, on, on embarrassing. Like, what's that line? What's that line? Um, and um, so someone sent me a, an amazing box that had this apron and one of these embroidered aprons, a little hard to see here, but, um, and I thought, oh, these aprons are so beautiful, but like aprons are not part of this project. You know, I'm not doing aprons. I'm, this is about lace, it's about this. I'm not really interested in aprons. I mean, I'm interested in these aprons, but I'm not, these are not conceptually inside this project. But, you know, I, as in the sense that you welcome everything that comes in um, as content that you may or may not, um, you know, that you can push towards or push against or push into, et cetera, then, um, you know, I suddenly, so the, the, the aprons were there and they were just hanging around like over here, like we're here, we're here. And uh, the other thing I had was like, someone had sent me, same person, all these embroidered doilies and stuff like that. And, and, and other people had sent me, you know, these like little handkerchiefs and like finger towels and, and they were amazing. I mean, you can't really see it here, but some of these are so incredibly delicately hand done, the kind of care, the kind of love that um, was 
attended to for an object that was never going to leave the home, that was surely a domestic object that has no kind of visible commodified value in our world, right? Um, that someone had paid such attention um, and such care. And I started to think about the labor of care and that another sort of aspect of the labor um, became visible to me in, in, this, in this project. And then one day I was sitting and I was looking at the arms, like I call them arms now, this, the, the ties of the aprons and they started to look like forlorn arms looking for a body to wrap around, to hold. And that was like, I was like, of course these are part of this project, you know, what's wrong with me? And then it sort of opened up whole new possibilities to allow the color to be to come from the things that people had sent me. And you know, that these are sort of banner-like or flag-like or as well as being like skirts and you know, and then and then all of these kinds of all of them being these kind of very tender objects that that are specifically would never leave the home, right? Except for the things that would leave the home on somebody's body, like the skirts. So I had opened up a skirt. And um, you know, just a couple of skirts and made this circular thing, and that was really exciting. So the sense that this is an incomplete object is really important to me. Um, you know, in the lab, we talk a lot about like what questions are on the table. What, what questions? What questions are you leaving on the table for the viewer? And um, and so that that sense of incompleteness is um, important. So these are so I feel like these are kind of things that are again in the in the act of becoming and could continue to grow like there's a couple of layers of skirts in in both of these so that they're they're about eight seven foot between seven and eight feet you know in diameter um, and um, I don't I'm not going to if I have time I'll talk about the books but I just wanted to show you there are these books that are hanging in there another thing well, I'll just say this I had wanted to make these books as as objects, they were going to be objects in the show. That was originally what I was thinking when, you know, back in June. And when I was making the objects, I have these other things that I'm going to talk about in a second. And I was like, you know, the books, it's just too many metaphors. It doesn't work. It's like, it's, it's just not, it's just becoming like throwing everything in a, in a thing and, and, and uh, doesn't really work. But at the very last minute, like literally the week before we we're going to install, I thought, you know, let me just put the book on the thing. <laughs> and it was just this perfect kind of interruption. Um, they're sort of here and in the skirt, they're kind of like embedded. You might not see them right away. Some people might not see them at all. Um, it felt like just the right, like slight interruption, slight break in the, in the sort of um, the expectation that's set up by the objects that we're looking at. Um, so that is, um, so as you move around, there are these other objects um, that again are echoing, echoing inside the lace. And these are, uh, glass gilded, uh, it's, gla it's gold leaf on glass, their hand, there's another view. Um, so, you know, I'm wanting people to be moving around and having things kind of, you know, <laughs> sort of following them in, in different, through different material languages and different visual weights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are, um, it's a technique called very glomise. It's um, glass gilding, gla gilded with gelatin size. It goes back to the Romans did glass gilding. It's a pretty ancient technique. It's still used today in a lot of sign painting, but usually you would paint the back. So this is gold leaf. Um, and then I, it's all hand done. I take a wooden stylus and I actually remove the negative space to draw the lace. All of the images are laced from the archive. And then the other, um, and so you can see over here is one of the books. It's kind of tucked you know, along there. So again, some people will see, not see it, some people see it right away. Some people will see it only through kind of traversing around the object in, uh, in a, you know, more than one time. But, um, and it's interesting because of course here, it's really clear in this photo, but, and also you can see here the, this, this position between the two columns, um, you know, that you can actually look inside um, the skirt. And I, you know, I'm thinking of skirts in all of those dimensions, right? Like, hiding things in your skirt, go, go hiding under a skirt, tucking yourself in a skirt, the, the kind of voluminous skirt that, that kind of is this, is this very, I don't know, potent kind of, potent kind of object of care, right? Um, and I don't know, there's so I could talk a lot more about many connotations there. Um, and then, uh, so you actually could um, peer inside the, um, the skirt and that is the interior um, of the skirt, which is a whole bunch of, um, you know, things that I acquired, including this one, which again is something I'll just tell you guys, which is it's an Italian nursing gown, nursing, 
yeah, gown, I guess, you know, undergarment or whatever, the like button unbuttons at the at the breast. And it's probably from late 1800s. And uh, someone found this and they said, you know, this is, you know, they sent it to me and I was like, oh, it's really incredibly beautiful and everything. It's a little too dear in terms of what it cost. So a group of my my LCC uh, collective, they gathered together and 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 gifted that to me. So I'm like, get, you know, goes right in there. So that was really sweet. Um, so the kind of the idea of interior exterior kind of same with the lace right this kind of figure ground interiority uh, the visible like an interiority made visible in, in the exterior and and vice versa all of those ideas and notions like clothing is a kind of covering um, but it's also a, a way that we construct identity I mean there's all kinds of notions around that that um, are kind of hopefully in there and that's just before we installed I said I didn't get any pictures of someone peering inside so it's not the best picture, but um, she's one of the gallery workers there. Um, but at least I got one. So this is the front room where you actually enter. So I'm moving us a little bit backwards, but I feel like the, anyway. So um, again, thinking of different, I could have had, you know, all textile, more of these, but I felt like I wanted like a different kind of atmosphere or a different kind of energy, a different kind of feel. And, and again, the different weights, but all of course, thinking through the lace and thinking about the lace and kind of, it's like a thinking, I, I, I think of it as thinking through or thinking with the lace throughout every step. So these are, so in just in terms of installation stuff for, for again, something I probably wouldn't say in a public lecture is thinking about like, you know, well, first of all, the wall, we were, once we got, I found that brown and they painted it, they called me up, they're like, oh my God, the brown is so amazing. It was like exactly the right color. It was dark enough, but but has atmosphere, it has like a spatial dark and kind of is both a color and not a color and kind of highlights the lace and then also kind of flips back and forth that figure ground between these graphite pieces and the white pieces. So there's this little conversation between the two um, of different materialities and different, and different weights. So here, these are in a grid, a fairly strict grid, and yet the objects are very irregular. And then these are very regular objects in a kind of contrapuntal rhythm. Um, it's similar to the glass. The glass ones are um, sort of um, also contra like, uh, like in a rhythm that's a pattern that doesn't quite coalesce, right? Like it's very difficult. Our brains are pattern seeking machines. So it's really difficult to make a pattern that doesn't end up uh, reading as like a line or a grid. Um, so that was, and I said to Trish, who's the uh, exhibitions manager there when she when we were working on this and she was so great because she understood my vision completely like we she was finishing we were finishing each other's sentences which is really such a gift but I said to her when we were hanging these and you, you in the lab especially this this fall will appreciate because we've had this conversation like the difference between object and picture and I said I want these to be hung like objects not as like pictures and Obviously, there's not a hard distinction between that. There's lots of fuzzy overlap, but that was important to me. And she was like, I understand exactly what you mean. And for me, that means that the space between these um, is a discursive space. Uh, it's not a neutral space. I mean, it's never a neutral space, but it's not, a it's not a space that wants to step away from the thing, but wants to be part of the thing. So the shapes between are actually part of the objects. And these are graphite, rabbit skin glue, and gold leaf on panel. And they are all also hand-drawn, even though they look like you know, imprints or something like that. Um, and these are lace, uh, again, from the archive. These are all images from the archive. And um, and so this kind of leads, is a little bit like connects the two rooms in a way. And um, yeah, that's all, I, and I've already talked about that. So I'm just gonna quickly run through some of these images of these, again, it's all hand-drawn using a pointed agate burnisher, which is a stone, a stone, a pointed stone. Um, and I mean, these are, I always joke that if there's a really hard way to do something, I will find it. These are really labor intensive because of the process, which I can talk about, you know, to anyone who's interested, um, after the fact, but these are all 22 carat or 13 carat gold. Um, so the white gold is 13 carat and all of this gold is, um, inherited gold, gold that I inherited from my dear friend um, who many of you have known about who passed away from leukemia. So there's a kind of another layer of, um, of that, the sort of, I don't know, echoes, echoes of, of um, people and time and labor and, and care and all the things that I think about when I'm thinking about the lace. Um, and um, just quickly, 
some of these. Oh, this is a um, this is the Rechicella lace, which is the sort of precursor to Punto and Aria. It's basically, it's so fascinating how this is made. It's one of my favorite. This would have been a piece of linen. This is all hand done. It would have been a, a, like a plain, you know, sheet piece of linen. And they would remove the, like the warp or the weft threads and then tie them together. So like, this is like the, can you see that? Like they would have just taken it and like gathered them and tied them. And so, the opening up the space between it by kind of removing some of the threads. And then over time, just realized that they were just removing, you know, linen is a pretty precious material so that they would make a lace where they didn't have to kind of remove um, material. But you have so many incredible uh, innovative things have been done with that kind of lace. Um, this is a crocheted lace, embroidered buttonhole. And these are the glass pieces. And one of the things about the glass pieces, like usually they would be painted on the back. So the, the gold would be really evident. You, so you've seen it in sign painting and stuff. Um, but I don't, I, I, I love the fragility and the kind of ethereality that they have when you know, there's very little gold on that surface. I've removed about 80%, maybe even 90% of the gold. And, um, and then they, they just sit in this kind of ethereal space. And it's interesting, we had the lace study box, there were pieces of lace, especially this Belgian lace or no Flemish lace, which is incredible. Flemish lace is just unbelievable. Um, and they had it, it stored in these plastic sleeves and held it up and it looked just like this. So I was like, okay, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I'm reflecting on this lace in, um, so you can see the gold kind of looks, it, it, it's very, like it can look like a mirror, it can look very gold, it can look brown, it can, you can and sometimes it can be very hard to see. So I'm grateful to the photographer um, who took the pictures for me because I, I make these things that are really difficult to photograph. Um, and so they were leaning against the wall. I think that, right, just to go back to a second. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to show you that again, so that there was a, a, a shadow reflection, but not one that was really clear, like it was a little bit hard, made them harder to see, and yet, um, sorry, all right, um, and finally, thinking of um, exteriors and interiors, I thought a lot about how you see things across the room, what we call sight lines, and, you know, curatorially, um, and how one would encounter, so like the glass things are back here. So there's these kinds of balancing and bouncing of different kinds of weights. And then also there are these great windows. So I thought very much about um, how that might look from the outside also. Um, and then talking about interiors and exteriors, <laughs> we did this fun um, lace, uh, Battenberg lace dyed. This is the only thing that's not dyed using um, the, Cochineal or natural dyes. This is a commercial one because the cochineal would be is too a little too delicate to be outside. But um, and that is in this gorgeous setting right on the Hudson River. Um, and um, that's it. And that's context for scale. And also because you know I cut my hair. It's like oh look there's my hair. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's it. And you can see these arms. Aren't they like arms? They're like you know hold, like holding like gathering, holding, praying, thinking, uh, you know, the way that hands are really, uh, anyway. And that's it. So I'll start off just like some of the, um, you know, like some questions. And again, as Patricia was saying, this, um, this presentation and lecture is more conversational in terms of the Q&A and I'm happy to moderate. And if you don't want to talk, you can send me the question and I'll say it out loud. And if you do want to talk, just raise your hand and we'll make this go. Um, and you know, I'll organize, you know, unmuting you or sort of saying someone's, um, saying people's names, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> I, I just wanted I to start the, out. I can keep the image up if, if you want. But. Yeah, let's keep the pictures up just because I think it's really right. nice to keep looking at the work. But um, Patricia, I just wanted to start out with a kind of, I know this is going to be sort of like a broad question here, but I think one of the things about your work um, 
uh, which is the, the long marker in the Patricia Miranda uh, vocabulary, right? It's like you're using all of this found lace, which has so much embedded within it, um, but as a found material kind of presents itself as it is, and then you move it through all of these transformations. Um, but the way that the the way that you put all of these things together, I think sort of obscures how many different ways you're deploying the lace and how many different metaphorical and representational strategies you're actually using inside of this exhibition um, and inside of your processes, which are quite conceptual, even as you talk about them and present them in a way which is really materially accessible. Um, so I was just wondering if you could just walk us through some of those ideas and some of those steps. Um, so for example, and what I mean by that is, for example, when you when you get to the place where um, you're showing us the burnished drawings and the, the gold leaf, the gold leaf works, um, you know, in representing the lace, right, in moving from something which is a found object to a represented object, you're, of course, invoking both metaphor, symbol, the index, right, how, how it is that this thing, which is a representation of lace, um, ties into these concepts about lace, memory, mourning, um, and a history of labor itself. Um, and it struck me during this version of seeing all of your work together that the, um, that the gold leaf etchings are sort of ex votos of lace, right? So if the ex votos are parts of the body that sort of ask for repair or tenderness, in a way it seems almost like your drawings of the lace become ex votos of the lace themselves. So reminders that ask us to care or something like this, or ask us to apply tenderness um, to the object as a whole. Uh, but that's just one you know, version of a reading. So I just wanted to, I know I'm sort of talking a little bit quickly here. It's also because Patricia talks fast, but um, I wanted to, I wanted to just make a little bit of space for you to talk about the, uh, for you to talk about your conceptual processing um, and how you're thinking about the different kinds of aesthetic strategies at work in your practice and how you see them coming together. Yeah, that's great. I love what you said about the, the, the kind of that idea of reiterating something in, in these different in these different languages being another form of ex voto. I think that's really I think that's really insightful and accurate. Um, I think I don't, I'm not even let's say I, I guess I would answer it in, in this way. Um, to at the start it, and then you can you can <laughs> jump in. Um, you know, we we often talk about intuitive cognition and uh, reflective cognition in the secret life, especially because I've been on this little you know thing for people to stop using the word intuitive incorrectly or like, um, and so uh, you know, locating where the intuitive cognitive process and the reflective cognitive process are are locating where that is in your practice in a sense, um, or in your process and. So I think I'm very cerebral. I'm definitely conceptual. Um, I think conceptually through materiality, right? And, and in a way, in the way that works in my studio practice in very literal ways are that I'm like a gatherer, right? So I start with a very cerebral cognitive process, which is there's a thing. Actually, maybe it's not so, so I start with something that's very, if I was to say, and I said this to some of you in the lab, like if I was to say, what is it in 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 the in your your heart, in your in your in the quiet of your studio, what is it that you want to touch? Right, is one way to kind of begin thinking through a process. Then the only thing I knew at the beginning was I wanted it to be soft, and I wanted it like a needle and thread, and I wanted to be doing this right. And then, so that I don't know that that's so cerebral. That's sort of but it's inchoate, right? Like in other words, I'm not, I'm not identifying or explaining what that is or what it means or what it should be. I'm sort of saying, oh, okay, that's, I, I want, that's what I desire. And then, then I will kind of follow that desire. And the, the lace is sort of, again, the lace showed up, right? Like I didn't, I wasn't really, you know, this wasn't even in my mind. I mean, two years ago, forget it, right? And so it came to my door in a sense. So the, the, the cerebral part is that I'm, I'm sort of like a gatherer. I, I do a lot of research at the outset before I make. So I might research materials. I'm interested in materials that have a long cultural history that they bring to the table. I'm, I'm interested in engaging with that history, like the cochineal or any of the other, like I work particularly with dyes that have a long cultural history as opposed to um, a sort of more open-ended eco-dyeing. Not that that's, it's not a value-based difference. It's just, it's a, it's a difference for me. And so I start out with very, a very cerebral thing, which is that I do a lot of research, do research into lace and the history and, and all that stuff. And I, I feel like I gather lots of information around me 
in the studio and um and you know it's almost like a conversation with that materi materiality and kind of what it brings to me and what it evokes for me and what it what it brings that's separate from me what it brings that what it evokes in me that's separate from it and kind of the the, the sort of rippling nature of meaning that is um sort of enacted in any kind of object and once i've sort of gathered a lot of things which is why this you know <laughs> this excruciating process this summer where i didn't really know what i was going to make like until like july you know i'm like oh my god <laughs> this show in september um but really trusting like wanting to like it was very difficult to do because of the time crunch, but really important to me to allow it to remain as open-ended as possible for as long as possible so that things could show up that I wouldn't like initially block out. Um, so once I've sort of done a lot of gathering and research, then um, a more intuitive cognitive process kicks in where I'm engaging with all of those things that I've kind of surrounded myself with, if that makes sense. And, um, and then the objects begin to tell me, they begin to be like, you know, I want to do this instead of this. Like the aprons were just insisting that they were part of the project. No matter what I said, they were like, no, we are, <laughs> and we're here. And, you know, and um, I, I didn't say no, but I didn't, I didn't, um, anyway, I waited till I kind of understood or they, they entered the space in a, in a way that made sense to me. Um, so I don't know if that answers or not. I mean, I've, I've said this a lot to many of you here, but so, you know, the, the idea of like a blank sheet of paper for me is an existential sheet of dread. Like I cannot, I'm not one of those people that can go make a mark and then make another mark and then make it like that is impossible for me, right? So I have to sort of do this cerebral gathering um, and populate a space with sort of ideas and information that I can like pick up and put down and play with and think about and and respond to and like put together in all those kinds of ways and 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 so then the intuitive process can kick in later so then when I'm making these I'm not thinking oh this has to mean this this has to mean this I've already kind of set up the conditions for a certain kind of meaning to unfold um, without determining what that meaning needs to be or how I want it to be done and then I also think about just the choreography of bodies in relationship to the objects um, how do I want to move in front of this? Who do I, you know, how do I want to think about those things? Um, uh, like a body moving in relationship to these objects. So that's, um, yeah, also, is that, is that close it's to- an open-ended question, but um, I think Luciana has had her hand up for a little bit, so. Oh, hi. Um, sometimes you put the hands up and then you forget, but I still have the question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for, uh, um, uh, for sharing with us your process, especially the part where you do a lot of uh, research, because sometimes I wonder how much research do you need to do? Uh, can you do all you want um, or you're gonna get lost in research, but it's great how you actually organize the research and in parallel with, uh, with, uh, um, with the material that you're collecting and then the two things um, goes together. So thank you for sharing that. But my question is about, you mentioned that, uh, um, um, your object of care function as portals. And um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about that concept. Oh, which one, the, the objects of care? Oh, you just mentioned while you were talking that, uh, um, that your, your objects of care, your laces, right? And they function as portals. Mm, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, no, I, don't, I mean, and I was wondering uh, at what level they do that and how, you know, um, how do you think they do that? And I'm, 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 I'm thinking about haptic level uh, of experience. Yeah, I guess, um, maybe I said portal, I don't remember, but um, I guess in the sense that they evoke, that they, they come into a space in this formal way as very visible objects, right? Like I am a piece of lace, I am an apron, right? And, and yet if one can hopefully kind of um, put things together in such a way that they also do other things, right? That are in some ways indeterminate. Some things that I'm thinking about that I kind of place on the table, but are not so didactic that someone can't come and have a, like a very different kind of experience. And so that's the, that's the evoking or the echoing, right? Um, and the idea that a, an object that's really visible can ripple out into, um, like, we've been talking a lot about this visibility opacity thing, and I'm really fascinated by this, this notion about how a really visible object 
like an apron can evoke its own kind of opacity, like its own unknowingness, right? One cannot really know this thing. They become sort of mysterious objects in a sense, right? Even though we understand very clearly what they are. And I think that that's what, for me anyway, art does, right? It's something that has, that plays with these notions of opacity and visibility um, in, in the sense that there is content that we want to be visible. I mean, this is probably more than I can really, more, more complicated than we'll talk about now, although we can, can be continued throughout the weekend. But this idea that a very visible object contains inside of itself its own opacity, its own unknowability. And, and the reverse is also true. So when I'm thinking of all those things as content, in other words, the visibility of the apron is a kind of content. It's not a short marker. It's not like apron means this. It's a kind of uh, visibility of this kind of labor of care uh, that can then that then can hopefully be also something that is not entirely knowable. And that we can also use opacity, like the, the sort of the opacity of the apron is also content, right? That that opacity allows us to bring, um, you know, to kind of engage with, like to bring our own kind of um, meaning to it, right? So it's this really complex play that I think art does, right? Um, and I think we think about that a lot in, 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 in the lab about like when you use like sim highly symbolic material in a sense, right? Or when we know that the apron is, feels highly symbolic in this circumstance, how do I make that not a kind of a didactic symbol, but rather a symbol that opens, right? Because icons are in a way reductions. So they are in their nature, they refer to a lot of things, but they're also have an opacity because they reduce things to their most common denominators. Um, if that makes sense, right? So that's a really, I mean, these symbols are really complex in the way that they function and circulate in our, in our sort of psyche, if you will, and in our world, right? That the way that these objects circulate. So I also think a lot about how an object goes into the world and circulates um, in a way that is completely outside of my making. You know what I mean? Um, and that's important to me. And that was the vulnerability. I wanted these objects to be so vulnerable that I didn't quite have control over them. Um, that was really important to me. It's delicate balance, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Thank you. Somebody, I think Anna had her hand up there. Anna has her hand up. Yep. And then Revy, I guess. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, what you just spoke about um, addressed one of my questions, basically the, um, you mentioned something about the content bearing nature of materials. And um, I was thinking and kind of rippling nature of meaning. Um, and I was wondering whether you think that this kind of history of the material is apparent in the material itself or whether it um, you get a sense of that history by conducting the research. And then that research ends up being the kind of springboard for the more uh, material organization um, and and you kind of just answered like talked about it right that um, you're trying to you're working with complex symbols that um, have a variety of meanings within a society and you want to organize it so as to affect a, a kind of controlled response while leaving it as open for a viewer to like open for other ways for viewers to interact with that. Um, but my question is actually more, you made a distinction between intuitive cognition and reflective co cognition, which I may because I haven't been in the crit lab, I don't know, but um, I was just interested in that and wondering what the distinction yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, it's been a little, bit, a little bit of my soapbox in the past. <laughs> so yeah, some people have not been in the lab this, fall or whatever, I can't remember when I started. But anyway, I was, you know, I do a lot of in, in working with artists and doing professional practice and being on panels and, you know, for, for grants and curating and all that. People are sort of, a lot of people are saying, I'm an intuitive artist. And I just started to kind of, it started to, you know, I started to say that people are, don't actually understand what they're saying, right? That to say I'm an intuitive artist without really understanding that intuition is a kind of cognition. It's a form of thinking, right? People are often saying, well, I don't think when I go in my studio, I just make, and then whatever happens is whatever happens. And to me, it feels a little bit like, and I mean, you know, everyone who has intuitive in their artist statement always runs home and says, oh my God, I gotta take that up. Um, but I think that it's, it's sort of, 
there's nothing wrong with the word intuitive, right? But people are using it in a way that feels like it doesn't really, it's not accountable to what they're really saying. It's not accountable to the fact that is the intuitive process is a cognitive process and that we go back and forth between this. So I've been using that intuitive cognition to kind of emphasize that intuitive processes are a kind of thinking. They're the thinking of the hands and neuroscience now, you know, says this very clearly that, that the, that the hands, um, you know, are like making is a form of thinking and that we think in different ways in different parts of our brain and all of that. So intuitive cognition is a kind of thinking with your hand, hands or thinking through your hands or whatever. And um, reflective cognition is what we do in the lab, which is we step out of the intuitive cognition and we like look back. Now in the studio, you're going back and forth between those things all the time, right? Cause you don't like, you're not always in the intuitive, but so it's a little bit, you know, of a like to make a hard distinction for, for you know, for, for definition's sake. But I feel like making that distinction means that those two things can bounce across from, because when one steps out and does the reflective cognition, when one goes back into the intuitive cognition, one has absorbed, right, those reflective things. And so in a space where we are trying to articulate ideas about our work and push the work in these ways, then that I, understanding that one doesn't have to go in the studio and go, oh, I'm thinking about labor when one is in this kind of the process, but that it is there, it becomes a kind of in part of the understanding that the hands have because we're, we're bouncing back and forth between these. And it can be really powerful way to begin to, you know, support the work. Like our job is to support the work, right? And to, to push the work, to, to understand that to go in your studio and work intuitively doesn't mean that you're just sort of making whatever feels good. And I, we want to make a distinction between things that feel good and things that are enacting meaning, right? Um, or understanding that they will enact like what, how we can enact meaning. Um, and that may feel good, but you know, like that that's not like the mere fact of expression is not a meaning making concept in and of itself, right? So that's like the formal kind of critical part is how we can kind of have those two things speak to one another in, in ways that are really powerful in the studio. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the distinction I would make. Yeah, so okay. I, somebody had their hand up. I don't know who it was now. Christine has her hand Christine. up. Christine. Oh, it was Revy and then Christine and then Shira, I think. Okay, for those of you who are raising your hands manually, I will ask you to use the little yellow button because I can't see all of your faces at once. Patricia can, because she has two screens, but the rest of us, so it'd be beneficial. And that's, um, the hand raise is down in reactions. And is that true? Yes, and it says raise hand. Okay, great. So I guess Ravi and then Christine and then Shira. And I just wanna bracket that Drea Cofield is here, one of the critics, but she has um, a small, I feel like she has a, a nice coincidental moment of connection to bring to awesome. this lecture awesome. that we should make a little bit of space for before we run out of time. Where, where is she? I don't see her. Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay, yeah. So who is going? Revy. So Revy, I guess. Revy, thank you. Um, I just, I just wanted to say, Patricia, that it was, I, I absorbed a lot from listening to you speak about the work that I hadn't really um, connected with when, when I just saw it visually. So that was a really great. I especially liked what you said about um, trusting when the aprons came in that they somehow would uh, become part of your work or you didn't really know how. And it just um, has become, I think, a really powerful part of the work in that aprons are such a, a symbol of nurturing and a very universal symbol of nurturing um, and, and, and part of labor that women do that isn't even visible at all like when they make the lace that is something that becomes visible even if it is a very intimate small um creation uh it it has it has it becomes something in the world where an apron is is sort of a symbol of work that is done that may not even, that does not even stay behind. So it's kind of connected to the um, Hindu practice, I think it is, 
of making these very elaborate um, designs with sugar and then the ants kind of come around and eat it and it's gone. Um, so um, I found your process of just uh, paying attention and trusting that this is coming into your space and that somehow needs to speak to you. Uh, very interesting. And uh, forming them in this kind of skirt, um, the intuition to do that as well is kind of like a covering up like there's a world inside the skirt and that is also a covering up of women's, um, just their, their essence and their being in the world that the clothing of this hoop skirt is intended to kind of cover up what is there. So th thanks for, the, for, Thank for sharing all that with us. Thank you. And that the idea that trying to take something that is as short a marker as an apron and to see how one might stretch out the space between that marker and meaning, I think is something I thought quite a bit about. Yeah, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, you know, it was interesting when I was seeing, um, when I was at the exhibit, there was a woman there and she said, she turned to look at me and she said, they're so beautiful, something like, why don't we do this anymore? And I thought, why would you? It was so interesting because all these objects are really beautiful, but there's an undercurrent for me of a resentment that, that there were certain things that women were allowed to do, also had to do. Like this was the area in which they had to, that they got taught how to do these things. These are the only things that they, you know, you, um, and this beautifying of labor um, and that that was the outlet, you know, whether you wanted it or not. So it was kind of an interesting thing that we had such a very different reaction to the beauty. For me, it was layered with a lot of other uncomfortable um, realities. The other thing that's kind of funny was I didn't expect to, but as I was moving through, I recognized a few of the pieces that I gave you. And they weren't particularly distinct. I mean, a few of them were, but a few of them were not particularly distinctive. And I realized that I had lived with them for a little while, you know, tried to use them. And then it was like, this has nothing to do with, with my, my life. I, I didn't know what to do with them. So it was funny to kind of be really starting to look at the differences when you're standing in person, it really begs you to start paying attention to the differences between the laces mm -hmm. and the, the method that they were created from. And the same thing with all of the aprons, um, which is when you start finding the books, you know, within the folds, mm -hmm. um, it really, the longer you, you sit with the work, the longer, the more that it reveals. Um, and then the other thing was I, having just seen the images before I went, I thought there was a place in which you were, you would be able to go within, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. there was a part of me that, that felt like I was like, I want to get in there. Like, this is this safe. It felt like this sacred, intimate space for safe, safe, a safe space for, um, and I didn't want to be on the outside. I wanted to be on the inside. That's, Sorry. that's great. Yeah, I think that what you said about the kind of resentment or, you know, is, is important, right? Like the, the idea of this, this labor, I mean, that's part of the visibility of it for me, right? Is making it like force, like here it is, you can't, you can't not see it, right? And also that this, the amount of, the amount of beauty and care and labor that is hidden, right? In places where people don't have um, the ability or privilege or access or whatever it is, you know, that people still will adorn, people will still like wrap, you know, one another in beautiful cloth. <laughs> they will still make things for one another, I think is a really important part of it. So yeah, I, I think that's a, that's definitely an aspect and people will come in and 
have come in and said, you know, this is really all about that labor, that labor that nobody saw, nobody appreciated, or what didn't have an outlet or whatever. But you know, people are still we're still fully human, right? In in all of those, in whatever circumstance we're in, right? When you're othered or when you're you're not given that like um space in the world to to do things, you're not any less, you know, you know, you're not any less human you're not any less an artist you're not any less a maker whatever it is and so people find these ways i'm interested in that too so yeah that's um that's great yeah okay we have about time we have time for one more question um before we'll just because it's the first time setting up to get into breakout rooms and everything i think we should give ourselves a little bit of time to do all of that um but shira has a question um i do want to hear from dre if we can Quickly. And then, uh, yeah, and so let's let's get into that, and then we'll keep it rolling. And thank you, guys. Shira. Oh, I put it in the chat for for Gabby to read. I can't really be on audio. Sorry. Okay. So Shira asks, um, can Patricia, can you say more about the inspiration for the glass and black burnished pieces? And also, how are you conceptualizing the addition of the new lace to the project online and in the use of installation for its next iteration? <laughs> Probably not time to answer all those questions. I think Gabby, what Gabby said about those um, those pieces, I think is is pretty accurate to the way I was thinking about them. Um, and then I think I might just uh, I think that the question of I'm not really sure about, about like the the you mean all of the lace that I've gotten. I mean, I don't know. Like that's the thing. The 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 goal. I my goal is to not know, right? <laughs> is to not know until I know. You know what I mean? Is to not try and say like enforce a kind of um, you know, to force a meaning on it and and to kind of work with these materials that again are such short markers that come so low already loaded to see if I can open up a space for them. Um, yeah which is you know, just a particular particularity to the kinds of materials that I'm using, right? It's not the same thing for everyone, but I think we can think about shorter long markers in, in, these, in these ways. So I don't know yet. I'm going to spend a lot of time documenting them because it takes, it takes quite a long time because I measure them and I photograph them and, and all of that and then organize the website. That, that's a kind of research, right? As I'm also learning a lot about lace now, right? I'm, I've gone down the lace rabbit hole. There's also like the apron rabbit hole, which is a whole other one. <laughs> Like the history of aprons is really fascinating. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, do we want to just <laughs> try aware? People keep popping yeah, up right. my my view. I don't know why that is. Um, where's Drea? Drea? Take it away. I don't know where she is now. There she, she is. Here. She's just not. Hi, Drea. Oh, there she's okay. Can she hear us? Drea, you're muted. Wait, what? <laughs> we were just gonna, you have like, um, this is like show and tell. This oh, okay. Show and tell and just hellos. Yeah. Hi, Patricia, that was great. I'm so happy I was able to join your talk this morning. Okay. And I'm very upset I didn't get to see the show in person, but I'm really impressed with uh, like just the sense of scale and the breadth of work in here. Um, it was really exciting, but I actually just um, was given a bag of ex votos, which I did not know that's what they were. I actually like the synchronicity here is crazy. Um, an, art, an art historian at DePaul University where I teach passed away a couple of years ago and she had a whole collection of these. Oh my God. And I just have, I was given a Ziploc bag full of metal ex votos to figure out how to frame and look. Like as soon as you started talking about it, I was like, wait, I think I have some like right next to me. Oh my God, look at those. Oh my God. I, Isn't we're that nuts? Talk, we're gonna have to talk later. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, there's so many in here. That's um, amazing. I sent Gabby a photo too. She That's can awesome. probably send on to you, but. All right, well, we'll talk later. Okay. Um, thank you. So glad we're here. And Jonathan, mm -hmm. see Jonathan has come in. Hey oh, Jonathan. Jonathan is just in, okay, great. Awesome. Well, thank you all. I'm going to stop the share now. Um, and thank you all for listening um, and for your thoughtful, insightful questions. Thank you.